Well, good morning, good morning, and welcome to White Oak Baptist Church. Everybody filing in, finding their places, everybody smiling and enjoying the fellowship. <clears throat> well, let's enjoy our worship together and turn, if you would, in your hymnal to hymn 573. Onward, Christian soldiers, let's all stand. <clears throat> we'll sing the entire song. <clears throat> <clears throat> Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with a cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe. Christian soldiers marching as to war with a cross of Jesus going on before number two at the sign of triumph Satan's host us flee on then Christian soldiers on to victory, hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loud is anthems raise. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With a cross of Jesus going on before. Number three. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided. One body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with a cross of Jesus going on before. Number four. Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with ours your voices in the triumph song. Glory, loud and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages met an angel sing. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With a cross of Jesus going on before. Good morning. Welcome to White Oak Baptist Church today. So glad all of you are here. 
on uh, this fine, mild weathered Sunday. Amen. It's been it's been uh, neat to see that uh, you don't need to be all bundled up. And this is that time of the year where the weather bounces all over the place. How many of you get sick because the weather's bouncing all over the place? Any of that way? I've been uh, I've been uh, fortunate so far to not uh, have that happen. But uh, n- who knows, right? But uh, glad you're all here. Looking forward to a good week. This is maybe the highest calorie week of the year uh, coming up with Thanksgiving. And so uh, then uh, maybe the highest calorie week and the most expensive week. How many of you are Black Friday shoppers? Any of you here Black Friday shoppers? How many of you here are online shoppers? You do all your shopping on, uh uh-huh, there you go. And uh, you can buy all your Christmas presents in your pajamas. That's the best way to do it. So um, my wife will probably be dragging me out either Thursday night or Friday. So pray for me, pray for me, amen. I got to act like a pastor amongst all those ravaged, crazy people out there. But um, uh, anyway, what a great week we're looking forward to have. But first, we're looking forward to having a good time in the house of the Lord today, uh, singing the songs, uh, enjoying each other's company and fellowship, being an encouragement to each other. Sometimes you stumble into church, you've had a rough week, and I pray that church today will be a good pick-me-up for you. The Word of God will encourage you uh, through the preaching of the Word of God and then the fellowship of each other. Let's do this. Let's greet one another in the Lord. We'll come back and sing that chorus in just a moment. Let's sing that chorus together as we find our seats. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. Several church members to remember in prayer this morning as we go and pray. Uh, First of all, an update on Mary Verone. Mary's uh, one of our... Senior saints in her church, 90 years old, Brother Jay Verone, our, uh, his mother. Uh, she, she was on death's door this week. Uh, Sunday, they put a uh, incubator down her throat to help her breathe and get the carbon dioxide out of her lungs. And she had an infection that was not uh, allowing her to breathe properly. And um, I was up at the hospital with Brother Verone uh, several days this week, uh, just really concerned her life was hanging in the balance. But they were able to remove the incubator on Uh, Friday afternoon, and uh, she is doing great. She is really doing well. So we're thanking the Lord for that. And my wife and I were able to go by yesterday and spend some time with her. She's back to talking and just her old jovial self. So praise the Lord for that. Those of you that prayed for Mary, uh, she's doing really well. I just got a text right before church. George Harvey was rushed to the hospital uh, with an elevated heart rate. And so let's pray for George this morning, uh, that whatever's going on there, that uh, the doctors will be able to get that under control and just that God would give us a good day in his house. Pastor Mike, please come open us in prayer. Lord, we think of George Harvey this morning. We think of him and uh, he being rushed to the hospital. Would you protect him and uh, help the doctors to find out what exactly uh, he needs uh, to be healed? God, uh, meet with us this morning. We ask for your power in our lives. We ask for your challenge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Please take your hymnals again, and if you would, open them to hymn 588, My Sins Are Gone, 588. We'll sing the entire song. How many are glad their sins are gone? Amen. All right. You ask me why I'm happy, so I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. And when I meet the scoffers who ask me where they are, I say, my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn. 
In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. Number two, twas at the old time altar where God came in my heart, and now my sins are gone. The Lord took full possession, the devil did depart. I'm glad my sins are gone. There underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn, in the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. Number three. When Satan comes to tempt me and tries to make me doubt, I say, my sins are gone. You got me into trouble, but Jesus got me out. I'm glad my sins are gone. There underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn, in the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. Number four, I'm living now for Jesus. I'm happy night and day because my sins are gone. My soul is filled with music. With all my heart I say, I know my sins are gone. There underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. I wonder how many of you this morning stumbled into church just wondering how you're going to make it another day, another week. You're going through a hard time in your life and you're just not sure how you're going to carry your problem. I'm looking across the page there from 588. 589 is he's able. And I'm here today to tell you that God is able. You may not be able, but God is able. Can we sing that song a cappella together? 589 in your hymnal. Can you turn over there? Free. He made the lame to walk again, and He calls the blind to see. That chorus again, He's able, He's able, I know He's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. Hope that's an encouragement to you. Ushers, come on forward. At this time, we're going to uh, meet our guests today. We have several visitors in the crowd, and some of you have been here before, but it's been a long, long time, and others of you, it looks like it might be your first time here. So whether it's your first time in a while or just your, or your first time here, we have a gift we'd like to give you as well as a connection card. If you wouldn't mind, just quickly slip up your hand there, and we can get that for you. Down here on my left, auditorium right, I met Rich a little earlier. He's been here before, been, he said, about five years, and so good to have him. As well as this uh, gentleman here up from Florida. Tell me your name again. Jay Peel. Jay Peel. Jay used to come here a while back, but uh, living down in Florida, got to come up and say, I believe it's your mom. Is that correct? And glad to have you in service today. Back here on my left, good to have you both in service this morning. Glad you're here, as well as this couple here on my right. So um, if you don't mind uh, the uh, connection card, if you would fill that out and drop that in the offering plate in a few minutes. And the book is yours as a gift. Thank you for, so much for coming and being a part of our church this morning. At this time, we're going to have our choir come and uh, bless our heart with song.
let's take our hymnals and stand again, if we would, together, and turn to hymn 595. Just a closer walk with thee. We'll sing the entire song. Hymn 595. <clears throat> I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Number two. Through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but thee, dear Lord, none but thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Number three, when my feeble life is o'er, time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely o'er, to Thy kingdom shore, to Thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Thank you. You may be seated. Usher, if you would make your way forward. Uh, just as a reminder, this Tuesday we are having our Thanksgiving. Uh, meal here at the church. It'll be a different kind of service. I believe the service is held upstairs in the fellowship hall. So when you come to church, uh, just proceed right upstairs to the fellowship hall. Um, just as, also as another reminder, uh, those of you that signed up to make a meal uh, for that Thanksgiving dinner, the uh, bags um, will be given to you. They'll be upstairs. They'll be down here. Uh, and they'll have your name on it and all the ingredients that you uh, uh, need to make that meal. So just be aware immediately after service. Don't uh, uh, get out of here quick, but be aware that you need to pick up a bag because you're making a meal. So just for those that uh, had signed up, uh, be aware of that, please. I, if I could have Jake Holly prayer for this morning's offering, please.
2 Kings chapter 19 in your Bibles this morning, 2 Kings 19. Want to come back around and say something about our, our uh, community Thanksgiving dinner this Tuesday evening. Uh, whether or not you have signed up to bring something, we hope you'll come. We'll hope you come, and that's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, it starts at 7 o'clock. We'll probably be out close to 8.30, and we're going to have uh, turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes and all the fixings. You get to have Thanksgiving dinner twice this year if you come, and it will be uh, free of charge to everyone. Uh, again, the church is taking care of the ingredients. How many of you are familiar with the concept of Blue Apron, Blue Apron that's going on. How many of you are familiar with that? Uh, for those that don't know how to cook or are lazy and don't want to go shopping, Blue Apron drops off the ingredients, gives you a recipe. All you got to do is just prepare what they give you and a nice meal comes out. So uh, we, we thought about changing our name to Blue Apron Baptist Church, but um, we're not going to do that. Uh, but we do have all of the ingredients out there for those of you that helped prepare. We may need help preparing additional. I don't know that for certain, but if you would like to either take uh, home a second dish to prepare or even a first dish, uh, you can see Miss Rachel Rivera in the lobby after the service and ask her, and she can get you going in the right direction. One of the things I'd like to quickly emphasize is that our ladies' Christmas luncheon is coming up. And I know a lot of um, uh, different groups in the church have different uh, activities, Sunday school classes and things. Ladies, this is meant for the whole church. Whether you just started coming or you have been a charter member of our church, we want you to attend this. Uh, you're going to have a great time. It's uh, $25 a lady. Uh, you're going to meet at Gusto's in Milford, right there on the Post Road. I took my wife there for a date about three weeks ago just to check out the food. I, I would hate for you all to get poisoned or something. And so uh, I went there and uh, had a nice uh, uh, steak, and, and the food was excellent. The food was excellent. I guarantee if you go, you'll enjoy the food, but more you'll enjoy the fellowship with the other ladies. So uh, go and enjoy that. There is a lady coming in from another ministry who's going to be speaking, and she'll do a fine job, I'm sure. Uh, so, uh, other than the cost of the meal, the church is not charging anything additional. So, just what Gusto's is charging. But uh, that is December 2nd. What time is that? Noon? What time? It's at 1? One? 1 o'clock. So, eat a late breakfast and come ready for that. Uh, I would encourage all the ladies in the church to attend. And I uh, let, uh, hope you all can do that and have a good time. 2 Kings 19. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. We're going to look at the first four verses together uh, in our reading of the text this morning, and then we'll be looking at chapters 18 and 19 pretty extensively uh, today. So we'll read these responsively. I'll begin in verse 1. We'll read verses 2 and 4 out loud. Um, so the Bible says there in verse 1, And it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elder of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, which the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up the prayer for the remnant that are left. I'm going to preach a sermon this morning entitled this, What to Do in Your Day of Trouble. What to do in your day of trouble. Let's pray. God, we ask this morning that you would show us through this story exactly what it is that uh, each of us need to get through uh, our days of trouble. And I can say as a man and as someone who uh, looks at my own abilities and talents that oftentimes I depend on myself if I'm not careful. Uh, I, I rely on my own intellect. I rely on my own experiences and my own wisdom and strength. And God, that is exactly the opposite of what you want us to do. I pray that today the preaching of your word would resonate in our hearts, would make sense, and Lord, would help alter some of our thinking so that, uh, God, we can copy the example of Hezekiah and the children of Judah here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. 
Now this story we find in 2 Kings 18 and 19 is one, of, is one that is unfamiliar to most Christians. In fact, if um, you're a new Christian, you probably never heard this. And there's a chance that you could have been going to church for decades and never heard this story, or at least not be very familiar with it. Interestingly enough, though, this story is recorded in the Bible three times. Three times. David and Goliath is in there once. Noah and the ark is in there once. The Hebrew boys throwing in their fiery furnace is in there once. Now, some of these stories are referenced in other places, but this story is told in its entirety three different times. 2 Kings 18 and 19, 2 Chronicles 32, and then Isaiah tells it in 36 and 37 of his book. Now, Isaiah 36 and 37, um, you can flip over there if you'd like. We're not going to look at it today, but it's fascinating that those chapters are almost identical to 2 Kings 18 and 19, and I mean almost identical. There's a little bit of words that are a little bit different, but the chapters are almost the same length and some of its content is exactly the same. Why would God put the story in the Bible three times? If you've been going to church any length of time, you know that God isn't repetitive just for the sake of being repetitive. He's repetitive because He's trying to make a point to us that, hey, pay attention right here. This is important. This is important, and you need to gather what I'm trying to uh, teach you through this story, and you need to learn those points. Now, the, the account in Kings and Isaiah, again, are, are just about the same. In a few moments, we will talk about King Hezekiah and Judah's great day of trouble, as it is stated there in, uh, I believe it's verse number 3, their great day of trouble. Um, now, uh, that phrase, day of trouble, is mentioned over and over again in all three accounts with this. Now, I look back on my life and some days of trouble that I've had, and I can remember uh, there being just some really difficult circumstances, and the most heavy stories I won't share today, I've shared those with you uh, a couple of times uh, in my uh, in, in through the services, so I've reached down in the bag and I've pulled out some that are a little bit more light, a little bit more uh, uh, funny, maybe in nature, but nonetheless, at the time, they weren't so funny. I look at self-inflicted trouble in my life. I remember when I was uh, 14 years old, uh, my father had been taking me to this Christian camp called Smite Camp, Summer Missionary Institute of Training and Evangelism. It was not your typical teen camp. You would go there and it was more like Christian boot camp for a teenager. You'd go there and you would um, uh, get up in the morning and you would attend sort of like college class and they had four levels. The first year you went, you were in level one, you took a test at the end of the week and then if you passed the test, the next year you went to level two and on through level four and then at the end of uh, the week, the level four kids that passed their test would graduate and they would teach you something different each week and each, um, each uh, uh, class had to do with how to work with children, how to work with children, how to run a backyard Bible club. And so in the morning, we'd go to classes, and then uh, we'd have lunch, and then we would uh, practice uh, uh, our backyard Bible clubs as a team. They'd put us in teams. And then we'd head out into the area, and we'd find a neighborhood. We'd gather some kids together in the neighborhood. We'd sit them down under a tree. We would teach a lesson. And then uh, after that, uh, we'd pile back in the vans, and we'd head back to the campground, and we'd gather together after dinner, and we would sing for about an hour and a half. We'd have some skits mixed in there. And then there would be about two hours of just red-hot preaching, fire and brimstone preaching, and that would get over, and then sometimes the invitations would run past midnight as kids were getting their hearts right with God. It was, it was a, uh, you could say it was a staple part of my um, uh, late childhood, preteen years, and then into my teen years. And the guy who ran it, his name was Jerry Pertell, and everybody called him Uncle Jerry. And his wife's name was Vicky. everybody called her Aunt Vicky. In the South, you don't say aunt, you say aunt. So if you ever hear me say aunt, just understand, I, didn't, I, I ain't from around here, amen? Um, uh, aunt Vicky and Uncle Jerry, as they're uh, affectionately called, and I believe they're still running that same camp today. And boy, God called me into the ministry uh, there when I was a young man, and that had just a, a, a great impact on my life. Well, every summer, Uncle Jerry would gather together four or five teenagers that would come to that camp, and it would be worked out ahead of time with parents and things. And we would travel with him all over the southeast, 
and we would do uh, vacation Bible schools in the evening or morning, and then whichever one, it, uh, uh, the opposite of that, we would do backyard Bible clubs in that neighborhood around uh, town there. And so uh, one summer I traveled with uh, Uncle Jerry uh, doing that with three or four other teenagers, had a great time. We saw hundreds of, of, of young people saved uh, that summer. And uh, there was a carnival that was going on in town, uh, uh, at one of the places we went to. So we went and we passed out tracks. He had taken a bus and he had carpeted the inside of this bus. And uh, he had a movie he would show. It was a, like a 15-minute movie that was enjoyable. It was a hot summer day. And so people would come in and watch the movie. And then he'd get up and give the gospel. And people would get saved and off the bus and on to the next carnival thing. It was really quite something. So we would work that bus and things and pass out invitations for it, tickets to it. And then uh, one night, after all that was done, they bought us one of those bands where you can write anything you want. And they let us in. They also gave us money to eat concessions. And I mean, I had a funnel cake, and I had hot dogs, and I had a large soda. I probably had uh, fried Oreos. I don't know what I had. But all of the, the grease and all of the nasty stuff you can put in your body as a 14-year-old boy, I was a human vacuum cleaner. I was just, I was sucking it all in. Now, how many of you here enjoy roller coasters? Let me see your hand if you enjoy roller coasters. How many of you are terrified, will not get on a roller coaster? I do roller coasters. I love roller coasters. My wife hates roller coasters. But we've made it this long, amen? Um, but I can't stand the rides that spin you in a circle around one given point. I did not know that until after I put all that in my body. And so you know that where you get in and it spins you in circles and they got that wheel in the middle? And you can make it go even faster? Well, a couple of the boys that were with me decided that they needed to make it go faster. And they had that thing whipping around. And uh, I, got, I stumbled off that ride. I was, I, you know, when you get the cold sweats, and it starts like right on your upper lip, right? And then it just like takes over your body. I, I stumbled off the ride, and everything that was inside of me became, came out of me. And i got to say, that was a day of trouble for me. <laughs> and it wasn't just a five-minute ordeal, all right? I stumbled around, and every garbage can I found, uh, I, I left my marking behind. And, um, I, you know, I'm trying to tough it out, be this tough teenage kid. I can do this. I, you know, I'm, I'm okay. And, and, you know, i got some older teenage boys with me I'm trying to impress. And so we get on another roller coaster type ride, and it breaks down while we're up in the air, and I'm hanging upside down by a lap bar, and I wasn't done. It was one of these deals where there were people below me. Let me just say, I wasn't the only one that had a day of trouble. Self-inflicted trouble. Self-inflicted trouble. Now, again, um, I, I went to bed that night thinking I was going to die. You ever been there? You ever been there? And it's funny now to look back on, um, uh, but at that time it wasn't so funny. It was, uh, everyone else thought it was funny. I didn't think it was funny. I can think of other days in my life where, looking back, I still don't think they're funny. They were troublesome then, and looking back on them is painful to think about. And if I'm honest with myself, just as guilty as I was of cramming all that garbage in my belly and causing my own problem, being um, uh, unperceptive enough to get on that ride, some of the pain and hurt in my heart and life that I have experienced, I put mental garbage in me through my eyes and my ears, and I made bad decisions that set myself up for pain and hurt. Am I alone this morning? Am I alone? How about other inflicted trouble? Other inflicted trouble. Um, Angela and I uh, got married back in 2007. And, man, we were broke as all get out. I remember our, uh, we got married in a large church, uh, Rosedale Baptist Church down in uh, Baltimore. I think they run like 2,000 now. They're, they're a large ministry. Back then they were probably running 12 or 1,300. And my father was on staff at the church. And so I think Angela got like two or three baby showers, you know, or mar marital showers, excuse me. We were not pregnant. Amen. <laughs> Let me make sure I clarify that. 
The baby came after the wedding. All right, get that out there. Some of you ready to have a vote and throw me out of here. Um, marital shower. I think she had two or three uh, wedding showers, and uh, they were just so kind and gracious to us. And uh, I was six credits shy of uh, being able to graduate going into my last semester. And so I took that semester off, and I went home, and I worked three jobs to try to pay off some debt and save just a little bit of money so that we could put a security deposit down on an apartment and just get going. And um, uh, I went back and finished those six credits, three weeks of summer school, and we got married the Friday after I finished. And uh, I remember that we were so poor when we got married that uh, we, um, uh, we, we used people's timeshares in order to take a honeymoon. And uh, I can remember getting the cards together that were put in the basket. And on our way out, we were opening the cards and taking all the 50s and 20s out so we'd be able to, to buy the food and just enjoy our, our honeymoon together. And God was good and God provided, but it was tough. It was tough. We were working a Christian school job and we were uh, scraping by on next to nothing. I think our discretionary money was like negative $5 every month. You know what I mean? We just didn't have anything. And um, uh, the, we were really having to learn to trust the Lord. Uh, I was brand new of being out of the home. Uh, out of the home and, and, and learning my wife, her, she was learning me. And I remember just, just being as poor as, as we could be. The uh, apartment below us at the time was surrounded by a SWAT team. And uh, Angela was told, don't leave the house, just stay inside. They, the SWAT team actually came in our apartment to get the floor plan. And then they kicked in the door and went in the windows with snipers all around the house and arrested the guy directly below us because he had committed a murder in Baltimore. This is the area that we were living in. It was quite a time in our lives. And um, uh, I got a bill in the mail, and it was several thousand dollars. And it was like four years old. And I thought, what is this? Well, I had, uh, I had been hospitalized during my time in college, and I was under my parents' insurance. The ind- I found out later, the individual that had taken down my insurance information got one letter of the policy number wrong. And so it got rejected. But the bill did not find me until after four years later after I was married. And I had been there several days. And so this bill was astronomically high. And I called and tried to refute, and they said, no, you know, the timing of this is too late, and we, uh, you have to pay the bill or it's going to affect your credit. And uh, I remember just that day being like someone had hit me in the stomach. How am I going to pay this bill? Where is this coming from? It was nothing I had done wrong. Someone else had made a mistake, and I was paying for it. Again, not the worst thing in the world. God provided the money, and we, we, we were able to pay the bill, but... I look back at that as a problem, a day of trouble caused by other people. Sometimes our troubles are self-inflicted. Sometimes they're others-inflicted. But sometimes they are God-inflicted trouble. And sometimes they're Satan-inflicted trouble. Listen, let's uh, let's be honest with ourselves this morning. Sometimes God will allow um, a troublesome time in your life because He is correcting you. What does the Bible tell us? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Now, I love how God chastens us, all right? Look here. He loveth and he delighteth, all right? And then in the middle of this love and delight sandwich, you find the meat of correction. God always corrects us with love and while delighting in us. But sometimes that chastening comes and God does it because He loves us and because He delights in us and He's trying to bring us back in line. And that day of trouble is brought into our life because God is saying, look, if you're not going to trust me, if you're not going to follow me, I'm going to punish you to bring you back in line. Other times we find people like Job, right, who uh, had done nothing wrong. He was perfect and eschewed evil, that word perfect meaning mature. Uh, He was a good man, and God pulled back the curtain on Satan and said, uh, you can't get him to sin, and Satan said, let me at him. And so God did, and Satan inflicted trouble. Sometimes that happens to us. Now, King Solomon uh, told us that there are different seasons while living under the sun, right? Um. He said there's a time to rejoice and a time to weep. A time to rejoice and a time to weep. It's hard to rejoice during our day of trouble. Sometimes it's just easy to put your head down and weep. Weep. Now God has given us a Bible filled with stories 
Why? So that we can find help. We can know how to do life through the Bible. I, uh, I have found that I have found that uh, I have been able to avoid a lot of mistakes in my own life because I've watched someone close to me make the, same, make the mistake before I did. And I was like, ooh, I probably shouldn't do that, right? Um, I've also learned to avoid a lot of bad decisions based on what I've read in this book. God's given us a book of stories to say, okay, listen, these people made these mistakes, don't you make the same mistakes, These people did this right, you go do that, and this is what will happen to you. And that's what we have here in 2 Kings 18 and 19. We have a story of Hezekiah who, for the most part, handled a situation beautifully in his day of trouble, and God delivered him and his people from that. And i got to say that when I find myself in a day of trouble, and I don't know what to do, I don't know where to go, whether it's my fault or it's someone else's fault, or it's a mixture of the two, whether it's God's doings or Satan's doings, I want to know what to do. To do during that time. And so we find this story of 2 Kings 18 of Hezekiah and the Assyrian army. And I hope that today, by looking at these points, we can have a better idea. Let's jump in right now. I've got seven points we're going to rush through. When a preacher tells you he's got two points, buckle your seatbelts, it's going to be a while. When he tells you he has seven points, we're probably going to move real quick here, okay? So get ready. Let's uh, rapid fire these off. Number one, notice Hezekiah's righteousness. Hezekiah's righteousness. Look back with me at 2 Kings chapter 18, and let's look at verse number 1. At White Oak Baptist Church, we're biblicists. We're biblicists. Um, we, we, we may not do everything perfect. We may not be the greatest at every aspect of our ministry, but one thing we want to do really, really well here is elevate this book, because this book is what matters. This book is what changes lives. So uh, if you come here, I'm not one of those preachers that says, after we read the text, close your Bible, set it to the side, I'm going to preach now. No, we're going to let God's Word speak to us here. So keep that book open. 2 Kings chapter 18, look at verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty-five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also is Abby, the daughter of Zechariah, and according to all that David, uh, I'm sorry, and he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. He removed the high places, and break the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces, look at here, the brazen serpent that Moses had made for Unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. Uh, ne- ne- Nehushtan. There we go. So uh, Hezekiah comes on the throne. His father was Ahaz. His father was a wicked king. Hezekiah comes on the throne, and Hezekiah decides, listen, what my father did didn't work. What my father did caused problems. I'm going to turn rather to my forefather David, and I'm going to follow in his example. I'm going to do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Now, I find it uh, interesting that in the uh, Old Testament, when you have a king that chooses to do right, generally the country follows along behind. When you have a king that chooses to do wrong, the country generally follows right on behind. And I think that just speaks to leadership. Leadership isn't holding a position and telling someone what to do. Leadership is living your life in a way that is worthy of having other people follow it. And that's what Hezekiah did. What did he do? He came in immediately as a 25-year-old kid with all the zeal in the world. He came in and he removed the high places. All the places people were going and bowing down to false gods and worshiping idols, he went and he had them demolished. He wiped them out. He cut down the groves or the false idols that people were bowing down to. Notice there that not only did he remove the false idols, but he took away the false worship. This is important that I draw this distinction here. Now, not only did he cut down uh, uh, statues of Ashtaroth and and, and Baal or Baal, he also cut down and removed this a brazen serpent, a brazen pole of Moses' serpent. You might remember back in the Old Testament, Moses held up the serpent in the wilderness, and everybody who looked lived. Remember the story, right? Well, what had happened was they had taken that very pole and they had put it up, and instead of worshiping the God of the pole, they were worshiping the pole. That pole that had brought life was now bringing idolatry in the country. This is a problem. 
And you've got to believe there were people who looked at uh, Hezekiah and said, I cannot believe you're taking a symbol of our history and you're destroying it. The Bible here praises Hezekiah for doing that. Because the people had taken something that was good and had turned it into something that was evil. Right before we moved uh, up here from Maryland, my wife was um, in Peru visiting her family. She went alone and uh, she spent a day out with her dad. Um, sometime before I had gone to Peru, and my wife and I together had had a chance to witness to my dad-in-law, and we were able to lead him to the Lord. And uh, my wife was out uh, just spending a day with him and, and her sister, and they, uh, they came uh, into the city square, and there was a large cross there in the city, just a large cross that was erected. There was no Jesus hanging on it, it was a cross... Uh, that would have looked similar to the one behind my head here. And when they walked up to that cross, there were people that were not worshiping the Lord of the cross. They were worshiping the symbol of the cross. They had taken the cross and they had turned it into an idol. Into an idol. And um, my father-in-law said to my wife, he said, isn't it sad that they're worshiping the symbol, but not worshiping the Savior. Isn't that sad? My father-in-law is still a babe in Christ. I don't know that he's really grown much since we led him to the Lord some years back, but he even understood that that is just to symbolize. Listen, if I come in here on a Tuesday afternoon, and you've found a way in the church, and I catch you kneeling down right there worshiping that thing, we're going to have a talk. That's a problem. That's not to be worshipped. That's to symbolize... That's to symbolize what Jesus did for you and I. Just like the Lord's Supper. The bread does not turn into the body of Christ. Neither does the, the uh, juice, the vine juice, the wine turn into uh, the, uh, uh, the blood of Christ. These are symbols not to be worshipped, but to remind us of what Jesus did for us. And He came in and He said, we're going to take this symbol and we're going to do away with it because it has become a stumbling block. And Hezekiah stood up for what was right. And i got to say, Hezekiah, good job. Number two, notice Hezekiah's rebellion. Rebellion. You say, oh, hold on, pastor. You're talking about him being righteous. Now you're going to talk about his rebellion. Well, I'm going to to actually portray this in a positive light. Look down at verse 5 of 2 Kings 18. The Bible says, He, Hezekiah, trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him, for he clave to the Lord. I love the language there. And departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. Look at verse 7. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. In order to be righteous with the Lord, there are some things you have to rebel against. There are some things you have to set up and say, I'm not participating in that. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Now, let me give you the background here uh, to set up this a little bit better. King Ahaz, who was his father, had uh, uh, come under attack by the Syrian, not the Assyrian, uh, be, let me be clear here, okay? There's a one letter, really one letter difference in, uh, phonetically. You have the Assyrian kingdom and you have the Syrian kingdom. The, this is like Elijah and Elisha. Anybody here get those confused? Elijah and Elisha? Okay, you have the Assyrians and you have the Syrians. So his father Ahaz had come under attack by the Syrians and they were in a fierce war with them in the heat of the battle uh, the tide was starting to turn against the Judeans here and so King Ahaz who was a wicked man instead of turning to God for help he turned to the Assyrians and he said I need your help and so he paid them tribute money to send their army in alongside the Judeans and defeat the Syrians and get rid of them now that payment to the Assyrians did not stop Every year after that, they continued to pay the Assyrians so that the Assyrians would be in alliance and in aid to help them. What did Hezekiah do when he became king? He said, we don't need to trust the Assyrians. We have a God in heaven who can protect us. He cut off the payment. He rebelled against the Assyrians. He said, our reliance is not in men. Our reliance is in God in heaven. Let me just say this morning that if you're going to stand with your God, 
then you're going to have to stand up against the devil. If you're going to be for God, you're going to have to be against the devil. What's the old uh, adage that you hear both in church and out of church? If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And here, Hezekiah said, I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to clean house inwardly. I'm going to get rid of all the idols that people are worshiping. I'm going to make sure that our folks are going into the temple and they're worshiping the one true and living God. But that is not going to be just where I get the people doing right. My house, my politics, my reign is going to be righteous. And we're not going to rely on some, uh, uh, some army to help protect us. Our reliance is on God. He rebelled. He rebelled against that, that, uh, that alliance, that truce, that agreement. He said, the Assyrians are pagans. We're not going to rely on them anymore. I would say to you today, what is it that you have chosen to rebel against? We live in a day and age where uh, I believe we're approaching the end times. I believe Jesus' return is imminent. I believe it could happen at any moment. What does the Bible tell us would happen in the last days? That people would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They're going to go to churches where the preacher is going to basically give them a feel-good message every week. And it's tickle the back of your ear. You can make it one more week and you can do it. You're a good person. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. And they want to preach the happy, positive side of the grace of God, but they don't want to talk about the law. They don't want to talk about justice. They don't want to talk about sin. And uh, uh, listen, uh, if that's the type of church you want to go to, uh, there are plenty of those out there. Here, we're, going to, we're not only going to stand up for what's right, we're going to rebel against what's wrong. Because that's what true Christianity is. That's what Hezekiah did. Number three, we see Assyria's raid. Assyria's raid. You take a stand for what's right. I promise you, Satan's coming after you. Satan's going to come after you. Uh, there's an adage that I've, I learned a long time ago. It goes like this. New levels bring new devils. New levels bring new devils. You, uh, you take that next step up in your Christian life, I promise you, Satan's going to be right there to check and see how serious you are about it. You, uh, you make a commitment to start going to church every Sunday morning. And you're going, and guess what? If something's going to break in your house, it's going to break on Sunday morning. Right? You walk out and you got a flat tire. Oh, now in order to go to church, you've got to change the flat tire. Right? And you're trying to get the kids in the bathtub to get them, out, uh, get them ready on Saturday night, and the plumbing breaks. Plumbing goes wrong. And uh, you wake up, uh, you, you start the dishwasher Saturday night, Sunday morning you come in and your kitchen floor is flooded. If, if, if something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong on Sunday morning when you're trying to get out the door of a church. Are you all with me this morning? Yeah. You experienced this? Yeah. Um, uh, but you know what? Uh, God needs to see that you're committed. You're in. Satan may throw his best at you going to church Sunday morning. You make the decision to start giving to the Lord as He's commanded financially. And uh, the second you put that first tithe check in the offering plate to the Lord, you're going to have something come in that's an unexpected expense. And God is seeing, are you going to be faithful in your giving? Or are you not going to be faithful in your giving? You, uh, you make a decision to sign up and help in a ministry. Maybe you're going to drive a church bus, or you're going to help on a bus route, or, or you're, you're going to uh, teach a Sunday school class, or you're going to help in our nursery, or you're going to usher it. You make that commitment, and the second you step up in that area, now all of a sudden, you're going to get challenged. And that's exactly what happened here. Hezekiah decided we're not going to rely on the Assyrians. We're going to rely on our God. We're going to be righteous. We're going to rebel from their rule, their, their reliance, and immediately, Immediately, that was tested. The fourth year of Hezekiah's reign. So four years in, after this decision has been made, uh, Assyria began a three-year war with Israel, their neighbors to the north. Israel would be overtaken and wiped out for good. But the king of Assyria was not done there. Look down at verse 13 of 2 Kings 18. So year four through six, you have a war, three-year war. Eight years later... Now we're 14 years into Hezekiah not paying the king of, uh, of Assyria. The, the king now feels that he's gained enough ground to come after uh, Judah. It says there now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah 
and took them. So these outlying cities, you follow the story here? These outlying cities around Judah, uh, uh, around Jerusalem that are weaker, that are less defended. He comes in and he wipes them out. He comes up to the wall and he is demanding that the, he begin to get his tribute money again. Eight years later, eight years later, uh, after the Assyrian king overtakes uh, the, um, uh, the Israelites, he's coming in to take over Jerusalem. And what does Hezekiah do? Well, Hezekiah makes maybe his only mistake of the story. Notice number four, Hezekiah's reparations. Hezekiah's reparations. And that just means that he uh, 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 went ahead and paid him instead. Look at verse 14 there. It says, And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me, that, thou, uh, that which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So he says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I quit paying you. You tell me what it is you want me to pay you, and I'll give it to you. And the king of uh, uh, Assyria says, I need 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Look, look where Hezekiah turns to get the money. Verse 15, And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. At that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah king of Judah had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So Hezekiah comes in and he repairs the house of the Lord. He puts gold back over where it had been uh, uh, taken away from. And when this king comes to call him, he goes and he starts stripping gold out of the temple. And removing silver from his own pocket and from the, uh, the, the treasury of the Lord to pay this king to get him to leave him alone and to go away. Now, here's where Hezekiah makes his first and maybe only mistake in the story. He agreed to pay the Assyrian king what's demanded, even though that meant stealing from the temple. He believed that by paying the enemy to leave him alone, that he could avoid conflict. By compromising, he could win. What, we'll, what we will see next is that sin is exactly like the Assyrian Empire. And every other land-hungry, power-hungry empire that's ever been. You know what you find with them? You cannot appease them. And you cannot buy them off. What do you call a country that is geography hungry? You call them expansionists. Expansionists, right? Especially when they're willing to go and use means of war to get that geography and to grow. Now, they will play, and I mean these expansionist countries, they will play the diplomatic game as long as it moves them closer to what they want. When the diplomatic game comes to an end, they will begin using violence to get what they want. Let me give you an example. Uh, Germany, post-World War I, pre-World War II. After World War I was over, uh, the land was divided up and, and given out, and part of Germany was taken away and was turned into Czechoslovakia. How many of you here enjoy history? How many of you here enjoy history? All right. Those of you that don't, it was probably because you had a bad history teacher. So let me try to reverse that and be a good history teacher for you here for just a minute here. Germany was taken and they were divided up and part of their country was turned into Czechoslovakia and the Germans become, became very, very bitter. Their money became worthless. You've probably heard about the wheelbarrows of money that wouldn't even buy a gallon of milk, right? And so all this happened uh, post-World War I. There was a lot of bitterness and hurt there. Hitler came in on the scene and he wrote the book Mein Kampf or My struggle and he used that hurt he used that bitterness to really build his empire and uh, he began uh, 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 moving in on the Czechs he made up stories about the the Czechoslovakians being violent in order to put people there on the border and uh, uh, what happened was uh, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain from England he flew over to where Hitler was and he said listen I know that you want that land back how about we make this agreement with you we'll give you the land up to this point, but you must stop there. You must stop there. And again, Hitler is all about being diplomatic as long as he's advancing his cause. Just like this Assyrian king. This Assyrian king was willing to compromise and take as long as it had been advancing his cause, which was being more wealthy. 
And so uh, uh, Mr. Chamberlain, Prime Minister Chamberlain, flew to where Hitler was on three different occasions and signed different treaties in order to agree and giving up just a little bit more land and a little bit more land. But what we will see, uh, what history tells us about Mr. Chamberlain is that uh, if he had dealt with Hitler when he was small, then World War II probably would have never happened. But because he compromised, because he compromised a little more, and he compromised a little more, there came a day where Hitler looked at, at, uh, at Ireland and he said, uh, the English have backed up and they have not stood up uh, to me yet when I've taken all these others. They're not going to stand up for me uh, uh, here either. And so when he invaded Ireland, England stood up against them and World War II began. But the problem was now Hitler was much bigger and much stronger and much more capable than he would have been just a few years prior. World War II broke out, and it took the U.S. getting involved, our country getting involved, to save England and the rest of Europe and put Germany back in its place and all of the horrors that happened. What do we learn from our story here this morning about Hezekiah giving in and giving the money in order to get Assyria off his back? What do we learn from Hitler and uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain, who would eventually step down? I believe that was uh, uh, just two years before he died, he stepped down, and he is criticized to this day for the way he handled that. What do we learn? We learn that little compromises lead to great casualty. We learn, we learn that little compromises lead to great defeat. A little compromise here, a little compromise there. The next thing you know, that enemy has grown in power and power and power. Hey, you know what? It still works the same way. As long as you are willing, as long as you are willing, don't miss the spiritual application here, to give up a moral of yours here or there. It will take sin, will play that diplomat game, as long as it's gaining a little bit more territory of your heart. A little bit more territory of your schedule. A little bit more territory of your habits. A little bit more territory of your lifestyle. And when the day comes that you say enough and you stand up to sin, it's too late. It has grown big and strong and powerful. And you find that your, your level of character and integrity you have, boy, it is like World War III in order to defeat that sin out of your life. What do we learn here? We learned that if you uh, handle sin the way that Hezekiah handled the uh, Syrian army, boy, you're going to be in for a fight. If you handle sin the way Chamberlain handled Hitler, you're going to be in for a fight. It wants sin, wants the territory of your heart. Sin is an expansionist and it wants to expand all over you. Stand up to it in the early stages. Number one, we see Hezekiah's Righteousness. Read these out loud with me, right? When we get to the the alliterated word here. Ready? Point number two, Hezekiah's rebellion. Louder. Uh, Number three, Assyria's raid. Number four, Hezekiah's... Number five, let's look at Rabshakeh's ridicule. Rabshakeh's ridicule. Enter in the biggest smack talker maybe in the Bible, Rabshakeh. Oh my goodness. Rabshakeh, boy, he could talk... He could talk and talk and talk, and he could intimidate through his words. Uh, We're going to look at this uh, uh, in the Bible and see just how nasty Rabshakeh was. So the king of Assyria, his name was Sennacherib, and he sends his general Rabshakeh to mock the Israelites and to take out the Israelites. Look with me there at... um, Uh, 2 Kings 18, verse 19. We're going to read an extensive passage here, but I hope that the narrative here will keep your attention as we read. Look here. In Rabshakeh, uh, 2 Kings 18, verse 19, Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye uh, uh, now to Hezekiah. Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, but they are but vain words, I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust? Thou that thou re- rebellest against me. And behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on uh, which of a man lean uh, it will go into his hand and pierce. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust on him. But if ye say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away? And hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee two thousand horses, if thou be uh, able on my part to set riders upon them. 
How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain at the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? So not only is he bullying and putting down Hezekiah and their now new method of worship. He's saying, if you will come and acquiesce and do things our way, then we will give you horses. We'll better your army. Look at verse 25. And I now come up with hold uh, without the Lord against this place to destroy it. Uh, the Lord said uh, to me, go up against the land and destroy it. Then uh, said Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah, and Ra uh, unto Rabshakeh, speak, I pray thee. And I almost get the idea that they're whispering this here. Speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. And talk not with us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. So picture this here with me, all right? You have uh, the men Hezekiah had sent. You have a scribe and a representative of the throne, and they meet Rabshakeh outside the walls of the city, and they're conversing. And you ever been there where you're talking to someone? And it's supposed to just be like conversation level. But their volume is way up here because they want everybody else to hear. They're not really speaking to you. They're speaking past you. That's what was happening here. Rabshakeh is talking down Hezekiah. He's talking down uh, the righteousness, and he's talking uh, uh, bad about the rebellion. And he's not really speaking to the two guys here. He's speaking to the men that are sitting up on the wall, the men of Judah that are listening. And they say to them, listen, lower your voice and speak to us in the Syrian tongue. We speak Syrian. You don't need to speak in a language they understand. This is a diplomatic uh, debate between us. This has nothing to do with them. Look at me at verse 27. But Rabshakeh said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master, and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall, uh, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. You can read on down how that he just says, Look, we're going to destroy you. We're going to eat you up. We're, it's going to get ugly real fast. You've got no chance following that puny, puny, puny king of yours. What was Rabshakeh doing? He was rattling the cage. He was trying his best to strike fear into the commoner's heart. You know, Christian, if I can make this relatable to you and to me, this is what Satan does to us. We have some day of trouble, whether it's self-inflicted, others inflicted, God inflicted, or Satan inflicted. And in that moment of distress, that day that's just Horrible. Satan's right there to say, you're going to trust in your God? He didn't keep you from getting in trouble. What makes you think He's going to get you out? He can't help you. Satan's very good at selling you a lie. Number six, we see Judah's response. Now, here is the thrust of the sermon today. If you have been sleeping on me this morning, here's where you want to wake up. If uh, you haven't caught anything else I've said, boy, this right here is what you can take and run with today that will help you in your Christian life. I'm gonna, we're going to look at Judah, the nation of Judah. We're going to look at three different uh, uh, groups of people or individuals and how they responded in such a righteous way. Letter A, first look at the king turned to the Lord. The king turned to the Lord. Look at 2 Kings chapter 19. In verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with ash cloth, a sackcloth. And let's say it stopped there. He rent his clothes. He covered himself with sackcloth. Now, we don't do that today, but that was cultural to them. That was a way of mourning and, 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 and being in great despair. But that next step is the most important one. It says there, And went into the house of the Lord. That day of trouble came, what did, the, what did the king do? He ran into the house of the Lord. He ran into the house of the Lord. He threw himself before the altar and he said, the king out there has got 165,000 soldiers that have surrounded my city and he's talking horrible about me to my people. He's talking down on me to my people. What do I do? Now, his father called on an alliance, but he called on the Lord. It's one thing to say that you believe in God, but when that day of trouble comes, do you turn to Him? Many people who are uh, much smarter than me when it comes to the Bible have analyzed the 46th Psalm. 
there are many people that believe that this psalm was written by Hezekiah at the conclusion of this story. Can you turn over there for me? Psalm 46. Now, I, my original plan today was to preach the 46th psalm. That's what I sat down to do. But as I studied and I read and I studied and I read, um, I found that difficult to put together. So I backed up and I decided to weave the 46th psalm into this story here and show you why I believe that Hezekiah probably did write this psalm. Now, again, remember that he went into the house of the Lord in his day of trouble. Look at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Where did Hezekiah go? He ran to his shelter. He ran to his strength. He ran into the cave of God and said, I might be in my day of distress. I'm running into the house of the Lord because that is my refuge and He is my strength. Letter B, we see the prophet trusted in the Lord. The prophet trusted in the Lord. Now, when the king and the preacher are depending on each other and they're both pulling the country in the same direction... Oh my goodness, what a powerful, powerful combination. Hezekiah gathers some of his men and he sends them out to Isaiah, God's man, and he says, here's the situation, what should we do? Look at verse 6, And Isaiah said unto them, these are the messengers, Thus shall ye say to your master, to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servant of the king of Assyria hath blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Now, uh, Isaiah said, look, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I know who owns this city. I know who runs this city. I know who's in charge, and I know how strong and capable he is. Go back over to Psalm 46. Look at verse 2. Tell me if this does not correlate to Isaiah's sentiment. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters uh, thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. That was probably the sound of the, uh, the uh, 165,000 soldiers marching toward them and approaching them. Look at verse 4. There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. That's Zion or Jerusalem. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Look at verse 5. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. Now, when I started studying the 46th Psalm, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what that rivers of God thing meant. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was smacking me around and He said, you're studying the wrong thing. Stop studying the rivers of God and study the God that's in the river. Look at Him. He's the one that can help you. That river of God thing, now God might help me understand that someday. i got to be honest, I don't have it all figured out. If you know what that means, see me after church and, and educate me. Amen? But uh, here, what I took from this is that there is a God in the center of that river of peace. And that God can stand up and defend you. Alright, Christian. Are you born again? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus to save you? The Bible tells us that the Comforter has come. You have God living in the center of the city of your heart. You in your day of trouble? Can I tell you that God can defend you? You need to trust Him. You need to trust Him. But pastor, my intellect says this. Don't rely on your, don't rely on your intellect. Rely on the Lord. But pastor, the doctor says this. Don't rely on the doctor. Rely on the Lord. Uh, but pastor, my boss says this. Don't rely on your boss. Rely on the Lord. Listen, I'm not saying throw all those counsels out. I'm saying that put God first and trust in Him. Letter C, we see the people held their peace. Look, down, look back with me in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 36. So again, Rabshak is standing out there and he's conversing with these guys. And he's conversing with them at a, a voice level where the men on the wall can hear. These no doubt were the city leaders and even some of the commoners They're sitting there on the wall. And once the men ask him, tone it down and speak to us in Syrian, he raises his voice even higher and his tone gets more controversial and nasty and, and mean and degrading. And he begins to attack uh, not only the king, but the city of Judah and its residents. When he finishes saying what he said, look at what the people do in verse 36. The Bible says, but the people held their peace and answered him not a word. 
For the king's commandment was saying, Answer him not. You know what the people did? Nothing. They held their peace. They sat there. Now you got to believe that there were some alpha men sitting on that wall. Boy, they wanted to stand up and clinch their fists. And they wanted to tell that, that, that general a thing or two. But they sat there and they held their peace. Go back over to Psalm 46 and look at verse 10. Boy, this is a verse we all know, isn't it? Puts this in a brand new light, doesn't it? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. Rabshakeh, you're a heathen. I'm going to be exalted above you, among you. I will be exalted in the earth. Hey, those 165,000 soldiers that are standing behind Rabshakeh and laughing and scoffing and cheering him on while he jeers and pokes and makes fun of the Israelites. You're no match for our God. Just be still. Be still. Sometimes we want to retaliate in the flesh. Sometimes we think we've got all the answers. The best thing you can do is just be still. Number seven, and lastly, we see the Lord's retaliation. Now, God would send a noise that would run the army away. Eventually, they'd make their way back. Eventually, they'd make their way back with the Rabshakeh there. And upon their return, they would send a letter to Hezekiah that was very threatening and very uh, uh, filled with doom for the city. Hezekiah, again, would take that letter into the, uh, t- the tabernacle and he would lay it before the Lord and he would, again, call on the Lord for help. Isaiah would send a long response. You find that in chapter 19 and again in Isaiah 37, saying, listen, uh, Hezekiah, the Lord has heard your prayer and He's going to deliver you. At the very end of chapter 19, we find that deliverance. Look at verse 35. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians and a hundred and four score. I had my number wrong earlier. 185,000. So the angel came in and smote in the camp 185,000 soldiers. And when they arose in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, uh, Nisroch his god, that uh, Adramelech and uh, Sherezer, his sons, smote him with the sword. And they escaped into the land of Armenia and as uh, Hardon, his son, reigned in his stead. Here are these men coming in to defeat the Israelites. The Israelites, the Judeans, didn't have to lift a finger. They were still, and they knew who their God was. Guess what happened to all those men? They were killed by the angel of the Lord. The king got up and fled and was worshiping in his temple, and he was killed by his own son. What do I get from this? I get that God is bigger and stronger and more powerful than you are. Christian, it's not your job to retaliate when people mistreat you. It's your job to turn to the Lord, trust in the Lord, hold your peace. Turn to the Lord, trust the Lord, hold your peace. I'm going to use a phrase here I've used many, many times. Here it is. Let God be God. Just let God be God. Don't be guilty of trying to do God's job. Vengeance is mine, I'll repay. Saith Richard. Saith Mark. Saith Jay. Saith Mike. Vengeance is mine, say the Lord. Let God be God. Let God be God. His timing is different than ours, but His timing is perfect. There are plenty of people that shoot out the mouth about our God. They question His existence. They call His authority into question. Oftentimes, we want to hop up and take His defense, especially when they're attacking us for our faith. I'm reminded where the Word of God says, Let God be true and every man a liar. God will deal with them in His time. Are you in your day of trouble? What are you going to do? I pray that you will learn from the Judeans. 
I pray that you will turn to the Lord in prayer. You will not retrust in your intellect or your alliances. You'll trust in God. I pray that you'll do like Isaiah did and you'll trust your Lord. And I pray that you'll be like the people on the wall and you'll hold your peace. How about it today, Christian? Are you going through a time of trouble? Will you call on the Lord? Will you believe in Him? Will you be faithful to Him? Will your feet make your way to the house of the Lord like Hezekiah's did? Let's have our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Heads bowed and eyes closed. How many this morning are here today? You say, Pastor Lejeune, there was a day in my life I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone to save me. The truth is, if I were to die today because of my faith in Jesus, because of Him writing His name in my book, or His book of eternal life, I know that I would be granted access to heaven. Pastor, I am saved not because of me. I am saved because of Jesus. If that's you, as you slip up your hand this morning, I know for sure, I know I'm going to heaven. Would you testify that today? Is there one here that would say, Pastor Lejeune, I can't trust in a God who is not my father. I can't turn to a God who I've not even believed in. Pastor Lejeune, the truth is, if I die today, there's a chance He wouldn't let me into heaven. And that scares me to death. My friend, if you're here today and you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven, don't leave this building today without getting that taken care of. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. We have people all over this building that can take God's word and show you so that you can be 100% certain when you leave today that whenever that death day comes, you'll step onto heaven's shore. How many here today say, Pastor, you're going to pray for me. I'm just not sure if I were to die, I'd go to heaven. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? Is there one? How many of you say, Pastor Lejeune, in my day of trouble, I, I believe what I have learned today is that at times I can be too reliant on me and not relying enough on the Lord. Pastor, something that was said in the sermon this morning has showed me of some changes that I need to make. Pastor, please pray for me that I'll be able to make those changes. If that's you, just slip up your hand. Amen. Many hands. How many here today say, Pastor, I am in my day of trouble. There's a great grievance in my heart going through a very difficult time. Would you please pray for me, Pastor? If that's you, just slip up your hand. I'm looking around the auditorium. I'm taking inventory. I will not, not only pray for you here, but pray for you out of here. God, I do ask that you help us in our day of trouble. For some people, this sermon was timely. They're there now. Or for others, they're not in a day of trouble, but God, no doubt one will come soon. When that comes, may we run to you, not run from you. May we trust you and not ourselves. Help the sermon today to be tucked away in the hearts of those that may not need it right now and save it for later. And God, for those that are going through a troubled time, would you help them? Would you help them to trust you? turn to you and hold their peace. Help us to be still and know that you are God. Be with us now in our time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. With our heads bowed and eyes closed. The piano is going to begin playing. Our altar is open. If you need to make a decision for the Lord, if you need to make a decision for the Lord, you can come down and kneel and pray and talk to the Lord in prayer. If you uh, don't know for sure that you're going to heaven, Pastor Mike is standing right here. He'd love to take the Bible and show you right down here how you can know you're going to heaven someday. If you do know that you're going to heaven and you've not yet been baptized, baptism is a decision that's made after salvation, apart from salvation. Our baptismal waters are ready. We'd love to help you to follow the Lord in that decision. If you've been saved and baptized, but you've not yet joined our church, we'd love to give you more information about that so you can be part of our membership. Whether you make a decision down here at the altar in your pew, let's make them today. Let's determine to handle trouble the way Hezekiah and the Judeans did this morning.
Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. You can look this way. Thank you for being faithful to church this morning and being here. We're so glad to have each of you, those who come regularly. We have several today that are here visiting. My wife and I will be standing in the back of the auditorium. We would love a chance to have the chance to get to shake your hand and get to know a little bit about you and your story. And so we'll be back there and I would love to have that chance. And if there's anything our church can do for you, we'd love to. Don't forget this Tuesday at 7 p.m., at 7 p.m. will be our Thanksgiving dinner. I hope all of you, every one of you, are able to come. Our children will be with us up there, and so um, uh, I don't think that we'll have that. We might have a, a nursery for little babies, but outside of that, we'll all be together upstairs. So come planning uh, to, to be involved in that. You'll have a great time. One other quick adjustment to announcement that was made. The cr ladies' Christmas luncheon is at noon, at noon. So ladies, you don't have to eat till 1 to eat. Wait till one day. You get to eat right at noon. So come ready for that. Uh, that'll be a great time. You can sign up for all those events in the lobby. And if you sign up to bring some, uh, to, to cook some food for us for Tuesday, your bags will be available there in the lobby as well. God bless you. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. It's a joy to be your pastor. Brother Verone, please close us in prayer.